Okay, you're, you're all very welcome. Uh, good evening. My name is Angus Mitchell, and I'm part of Limerick Against Pollution. Um, Limerick is at a kind of crossroads, and some of those roads leading from this place are going to take us to an essentially healthy uh, future where we will find some level of well-being and there are other roads that will take us in the opposite direction and I think really why we're here tonight is to try and start negotiating the right road for us all as a community. Uh, LAP is a community-led campaign which is doing no more than trying to build awareness across the city about the essential perils and dangers that we face collectively if Irish cement are allowed to start burning colossal amounts of industrial waste. Uh, the Irish cement plant has been looming across the city for almost 80 years now. And I've lived and been a citizen here for 15 of those years. And I've never really thought very much about uh, what that silhouette represented. And it was only last year when I heard that they were intending uh, replacing their um, pet coat burning for industrial waste that I thought, gosh, I need to know more about this. I live within a few kilometers and this doesn't sound good. So I went along to a lab meeting, heard some of the voices in the room, and over the next nine months I've been very much part of the movement. Um, and I suppose I'm largely concerned by the almost um, negligent view of risk that Irish Cement seem to be taking. Uh, we've had a series of meetings in recent weeks with senior figures in Irish Cement and they say that there is no risk, no risk in the past, no risk in the present and no risk going forward into the future. And that's uh, just completely wrong because there's an environmental risk which has seen levels of dioxins uh, over the recent decades um, accumulate in the grasslands. There are extraordinary health risks. Um, a couple of weeks ago the Limerick Post published an article um, showing that 18,000 people, 18,000 plus people uh, used Ventolin inhalers in this city. That's uh, one in five citizens. And that is a pandemic, basically. And what Irish Cement intend doing is a huge risk to them. And then, of course, there's the reputational risk. There is the risk uh, that will affect properties and businesses across this region if Irish Cement is allowed to do what they want to do. And then if, as in the case that's happened in the last few days in in Dublin, there is some kind of accident, then the reputation of this region will suffer enormously. And I think what's also of great concern is that over the 80 years that Irish Cement have operated in this area, there has really been very little opposition to what they've done. They, of course, have brought jobs into the region and they've done a certain amount of kind of local philanthropy, but they have really not been. Um, surveillance and watched in the way that they should have been. And both the HSE and EPA, I don't think, and I think a lot of our own research into their work uh, and into their relationship with Irish Cement would prove the fact that they have been somewhat negligent. There is no real proper data that allows us to assess the levels of uh, health risk to this region. And so it's what, what we're facing is, in a way, a deficit in local and, indeed, national governance. Uh, it's more than just taking on the apparatus of a local uh, irresponsible industry. It, it actually reaches much further than that. And, of course, Irish Cement themselves are owned by CRH, Cement Roadstone Holdings, which is the most powerful company to have emerged out of Ireland uh, in the last 50 years. So in that sense, this is something of a David and Goliath battle, uh, and one that is going to require every citizen of this city to do their bit, essentially, to, to really preserve 
the health and well-being and the, uh, the purity of the air system uh, as such uh, going forward into the future. Um, the, the main work of LAP has really been to raise awareness and this evening we are really honoured to have uh, in our presence one of the world's leading authorities on uh, incineration and indeed on alternatives to incineration. Um, the Emeritus Professor Dr. Paul Conant, uh, who is, was, actually did his uh, doctoral work uh, in Cambridge, has spent most of his academic life in uh, teaching at a, a, an outstanding uh, liberal arts college in upstate New York. Uh, but his level of expertise has led him to address the United Nations on a couple of occasions and uh, Paul, would you pass me your book there on the table? And he has also um, written this remarkably important volume on the zero waste solution, which is perhaps the most uh, significant intervention in the whole massive crisis in the global waste uh, of recent years. So, uh, in a moment, uh, Dr. Conant is going to address us all with a lecture explaining the dangers, problems, uh, and alternatives to incineration. Um, but before that, we want one of our own voices to say a few words uh, to you all. Uh, Mary Hamill, I, I first met uh, at a meeting at the end of last year. She has now become a very active member of Limerick Against Pollution. Uh, she really does speak about this matter from the heart, and I think um, it's worth listening to her for a few minutes so that she can explain to you her deep concerns as to why we must use every, uh, every piece of um, love that we have to stop this from happening. Thank you. Um, I'm a little nervous, so bear with me. I don't do this in my working life, so um, I'm taking one for the team here. Um, I'm a mother of two children, and I live close to the plant. I became a member of LAP about the end of January this year. I had attended a couple of meetings, just like Angus, held by the group, and was extremely worried about what I was hearing regarding the, the cement factory and their proposal. The group seemed to have done so much research and told us that the fallout radius could be up to 30 kilometres, so all of Limerick would be affected. And it would be mostly through the food chain that we would get these harmful chemicals. These chemicals can cause things like hormonal disturbances, inability to maintain pregnancy, birth defects, immune system problems, lung problems, liver and heart problems, and cancer. Similar to me, the members of LAP seem to be all new working people, family people, and their sole motivation in digging deeper into the plant's virus cement was in the interest of health. They had and have no other agenda. Not one to believe in everything I hear, I did some research myself, and also organised a visit to the plant with seven other concerned parents. That was the 18th of January this year. We met with Brian Gilmore, communications manager, and two other staff members of the plant. I put various questions to him. For instance, why Limerick Cement only formed 500 people in and around the Mungish area, when this proposal affects us all, all of Limerick? Why they refused to have a public meeting? He was very vague with his responses on many of the questions. I asked about training of the, of the Mungish employees, as they would be moving from handling the current fuel pet coat to handling much more dangerous materials. This was also sketchy, and nothing seemed to have been put in place. The least I would have expected was that staff be sent to spend time in the European well-run incinerator with an impeccable safety record. I asked if Irish Cement Limerick intend to import tyres, as there is a big concern around the introduction of infectious diseases being brought in on these tyres. His answer was, it was not their intention but there is nothing preventing their tyre supplier from importing tyres. I asked him about the sister plant in Platten, in Platten Drogheda, and how the local people felt about the change in 2011 to alternative fuel. 
He confirmed all was well and there was no problems or issues expressed by the people in the area. <coughs> However, I knew this not to be the case. Local people were very concerned about an investigation into the occurrence of a rare syndrome called Gillian Barr syndrome. And this investigation was done locally. When I put this to him, his, his response was that nothing had come of the HSC investigation. Nothing had been proven. I expressed concern about using the existing ageing kilns, that they're too old, not built for this purpose, that they do not have fatal safe devices. And he said not to worry, that they were well equipped for their new use. I asked him about the serious big blowouts in 2006 and 2015. He advised that the first was due to wear and tear, and the second blowout in 2015 was simply down to somebody opening a port that should not have been opened. I replied that this was something you'd expect to see in a scene from Father Ted, and I felt he was quite blasé about the blowouts. I, point, I pointed out I had read their environmental impact statement report and told Mr Gilmore I was concerned with many aspects. In particular, the section give a list where they give a list of the substances they plan to incinerate. The word etc. appears at the end of each line. Mr Gilmore's response was that this was put in so that they would not have to apply for a licence when introducing even more material to be incinerated. I asked if they would receive payment for the waste, and Mr Gilmore made no apologies, saying that it makes perfect business sense to receive payment. It became clear to me it was about money and not about reducing carbon emissions. It was shortly after this visit that I became a member of LAP, as I did not feel in any way assured that this proposal was safe. We are even more concerned now, especially with all that has happened in the month of April this year at the Limerick plant. Irish cement had almost been dragged, kicking and screaming, to eventually admit that the dust finally analysed by the EPA came from their plant. This does not instill confidence that they would come clean in the future. We have met with the Director of Public Health Limerick, Dr May Mannix, and two of her, and two of her staff to express our concerns. They themselves admit that they are not experts in this field, lack adequate knowledge and have liaised with people with more expertise in Health England. <coughs> Health England say that CRH, are pro what they are promoting, may work in a well-regulated environment. But the HSC cannot take this advice at face value, as we do not have a regulated environment. Dublin councillor Keno Callaghan in response to yesterday's pool bag incident is quoted as saying, we have a poor culture of regulation. If this gets the go-ahead, the responsibility does not lie with any organisation to measure the health outcomes. Their plant in Drogheda is currently doing what Irish Cement Limerick are proposing to do, and no organisation is currently measuring the increased health risk i.e. levels of dioxin emissions, nitrous oxide emissions, furon emissions and food chain risks. It has been reported that Limerick is the worst county for pulmonary disease in Ireland. We certainly do not wish to be known as the worst county for any other diseases. To sum up, I have had two visits to the plants and am not reassured. If this gets the go-ahead and further down the road major health issues present themselves, I want to be able to tell my two boys, niece and nephews, that I tried to do something to stop it. Thank you. Okay, good. Yes, indeed. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for coming. I do hope you have some people that are for this plant, and I applaud you for coming, if you are for this, so that you can have your say when the time comes, and ask tough questions. Just to introduce myself, I must make a correction. I didn't get my PhD at uh, Cambridge. I got it at Dartmouth in the United States, but I did have my first degree from, from Cambridge. So, just to continue my introduction, I'm a retired professor of chemistry and I specialized in environmental chemistry and toxicology. I first got involved with waste in 85 when they tried to build an incinerator in our 
northernmost county of New York State, right close to the Canadian border. When I first heard about it, I thought that incineration sounded a good idea. We get rid of the landfills and we create some energy. And then, as I pursued this, I found that burning waste produces the most toxic substance, substances that we've ever made in a chemical laboratory. Between 1985 and 1995, as Director of Work on Waste USA, we helped to stop, help citizens to stop uh, 300 uh, incinerators from being built. And only one incinerator, trash incinerator, has been built in the United States since 1997. Just one. Since uh, 1998, I've promoted zero waste. And it's so nice to be positive, to have a solution which is positive, that people say yes to. They say yes to recycling, yes to reuse, yes to repair, yes to composting, and yes, most important of all, to sustainability. Uh, particularly in Italy, that message has been refined in Italy over the last 20 years. I went there first in 1996. I've since visited Italy another 20, 73 times. The issue has taken me to 49 states in the United States. I've never been to Alaska and 63 other countries. When I started, it was my determination that it, I would not make any money out of this. I didn't need money. I was happy with my professor's salary. Uh, my determination was to act as a consultant pro bono in the public interest and help citizens get the best science unmanipulated by corporate interests. Uh, that's what I've tried to do. I, I'm not saying that I'm right on everything. Like everybody else, I make mistakes. But they're going to be genuine mistakes. And you can be absolutely confident that everything I say to you, I believe to be true. I'm not manipulating anything. And I should end at that, should have ended at a corporate interest. I now have to tell you that the governments are not on our side. As you know, in the United States, corporations run America. They run most countries. And unfortunately, you've got agencies like the EPA who are the enemy. They're on the other side. They're literally working for the other side. They have revolving doors where the people that they're regulating come and work for them. And when they leave, they go back and work for industry. I think you know all that. Anyway, the end result of this 30-odd year involvement is, as Angus said, uh, this book, The Zero Waste Solution. And to give it its full title, it's called Untrashing, the subtitle of the book is Untrashing the Planet One Community at a Time. I believe that the only th way we can save, solve, save life as we know it, the standard of living as we know it, is going to come from communities. It's not going to come from the top people, the people at the top. It's going to come from the grassroots. And that's why your attendance here is incredibly important. You have got to beat this stupid idea. You have to beat it. And you've got to draw as much blood in the process, and not literally, but pain, so that they never come after you with another stupid proposal like this. So fight like hell is my message. Now the foreword to this book was by a more gentle person, uh, Jeremy Irons, as you know, a, a film star. He lives uh, in, in Ireland. And he hosted this magnificent movie called Trash. And if you haven't seen this movie yet, you must do. He went around the world uh, documenting some of the dreadful stories about incinerators and landfills and so on. And perhaps the most riveting and disturbing information is what we're doing to the oceans with nine million tons of plastic every year going into the oceans and albatrosses feeding their babies plastic bottle caps and not fish. A, a dramatic and wonderful moment for me was on Saturday April the 9th 2016 when I met the Pope and was able to give him a copy of that book you know what it was? You wait on a long line of people, on a, on a fence. You see them coming up and you say, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? Well, I was determined to give him the book. Uh, but what was I going to say? And 
I did manage two things before he had to move on. One was, thank you, thank you, uh, Pope, for uh, what you're doing to get people interested in the circular economy. And also, as I said, in uh, Italy, they're doing wonderful things on zero waste in this book. But what I forgot to say is my, one of my favorite things that I've invented, this, this phrase came to me many years ago, when the only thing they could accuse me of was that I was an environmental evangelist. <laughs> and this is what I came up with. God recycles, the devil, devil burns. <laughs> but I didn't tell the Papa that. <laughs> I should have done. So a few words about sustainability. And quite frankly, if you're not interested in sustainability, much of what I've said is probably going to waste your time. But here's the problem. We would need five planets if everybody consumed like an American. We'd need two planets if everybody consumed like a European. That's bad enough. But meanwhile, we have India and China copying our consumption patterns. And not only copying our consumption patterns, but copying our disposal um, patterns too. Right now, China is trying to build a 6,000 ton a day trash incinerator. They're trying to build 300 incinerators all over China to add to the dreadful pollution that they already have. So we have to set a better example. And clearly something has got to change. And if I believe the best place to start that change is with waste. Because every day, everyone, except the extreme poor, are making waste. And all the time they're making waste, they're part of a non-sustainable way of living on this planet. But with good political leadership, especially local political leadership, then they can all be part of a movement towards sustainability. In other words, this is our most concrete connection to the problem and to the solution. It's in our hands, these ten things. Basically, we have to convert a linear economy to a circular economy. Here's the linear economy. It begins with extraction of raw materials. You ship them around the world, and you manufacture products, you consume those products, and then you throw it away, waste. And you call development the quicker that you can do that. The more developed you are, the quicker that process is. So in the book, I describe 10 steps to zero waste. It's common sense. Anybody could have worked this out, I believe. Um, 10 steps. And you're doing many of them in Limerick. You really are. It's a, you've made a terrific start. It begins with source separation, these 10 things. Secondly, having sorted out, the most important thing you have to sort out is clean organic waste, clean kitchen waste, because we need that back to the soil. We need to feed into organic agriculture. We need island to reject GMOs, reject pesticides, and become world famous for organic agriculture. That is your future, in my view. But to do that, to use the organic waste and the domestic waste stream, you have to get it clean. That's why you need door-to-door -door collection. And then the, the next step, of course, is composting, and one that you're familiar with, recycling. You're doing all that. And later on, I'm going to be talking about some of the other steps, which are perhaps maybe less familiar to you. Now, a huge obstacle to achieving zero waste and moving towards sustainability and the circular economy is incineration. And let me explain why. Here are the arguments about against burning waste. It's very expensive, it's very complicated, it creates very few jobs, it's inflexible, it ties your hands for 25 years, it takes 25 years to pay back the capital investment, it puts toxics into the air and toxics into the ash. The better you are protecting the air, the more toxic the ash. It doesn't get rid of landfills, you still need the landfills for the ash. It is not sustainable, it perpetuates the linear economy, and there are better alternatives, which I've already started with. As more and more communities are rejecting incineration, there is a new threat, the use of cement kilns to burn waste. This is very threatening, because they're already there. If you try to build an incinerator tomorrow, you'll have a massive opposition to that, and you'll probably win. People get educated. 
But if the cement kiln is already there, it's not so easy. That's why you are so important, especially the ones who live close to this plant. You're working for all of us. Now, let me explain the difference between zero waste, the, the, the knife edge, the, this, we hinge on this nexus here. The zero waste message to industry is if we can't reuse it, if we can't recycle it or compost it, then industry shouldn't be making it. We need better industrial design for the 21st century. Zero waste is a combination of community responsibility, which you've already shown that you're willing to do well, and industrial responsibility. And we have yet to call upon industry. We've assumed that we have to do everything and we can't because of some of the stupid crap they produce. Now the cement kiln, on the other hand, this is their message to industry. If society can't reuse it, recycle it, or compost it, don't worry, we will burn it in our kilns and we will save our industry lots of money on fuel and get paid doing it. Of course they want this. There are chief executive officers out there who've said on the record, that they expect to be making more money burning waste than making cement. This is the profit. That's what they see. Barrels of gold. Now the question I have for you, is Limerick becoming a sacrifice area? Where you start contaminating it and then it gets, a, then the notion is it's already polluted, so you bring in another polluter and another uh, savage attack on your environment. Is Ireland going from green to muddy brown? I mean, I've always thought of Ireland as green, and certainly from the plane, it's very green. <laughs> the person behind me, when we, just before we landed, said, Woo! She says, Ireland is very, very green. And the person next to us said, Yes, that's because it rains every day. <laughs> or even red. And yesterday I had the thrill of meeting Pat and his wife, and they showed me these dreadful red ponds. And today, mud ponds, and today, with the help of Derek, we, we flew for 55 minutes around this whole region. And what a beautiful country. What a beautiful green country. I'm, I'm looking from the air at the most fertile valley in the whole of Europe. The most fertile valley in the whole of Europe. And you see all those farms out there harvesting their crops and they're tending their sheep and cattle. And then you see this savage red ponds here built right next to the estuary, just a few feet from the estuary. It's like someone slashing a Renaissance painting. It's like blood. It's blood on your hands. Blood on somebody's hands. Uh, and they say, well, this is not toxic. Uh, but Pat is making it all up. He's, he's just trying to make money. He's making it all up. Well, I tell you, he's not making it up. And you know how I know? Because the first thing the government does when you have a scandal like this, a pollution scandal like this, and the decision to put this crap here, is that they blame the farmer. Anything that happens, they blame the farmer. In Bonnybridge, Scotland, they blamed Andrew Graham for his cattle dying. Not the hazardous waste incinerator. He was a bad husbandry. And yet, his animals won prizes before the hazardous waste incinerator. Same thing happened in Pontypool, Wales, with another hazardous waste incinerator. And the same thing happened in Utah, when the sheep were poisoned, died in thousands. Then it turned out it was a release of nerve gas. And the same thing happened again in Michigan, where they poisoned the whole of Michigan. How? Because, oh, because it was bad farmers. The farmers were doing it. Bad farming. No, what happened is they mixed up fire retardants and animal feed. They looked, they came in the same bags, looked the same, they were side by side, and they fed polybrominated biphenyls to the cattle. Not the farmers. Um, little common sense here. How does that, that red dust there, that red stuff, get to his farm? 
It doesn't seem possible, does it? You see it down there, and he's up on the hill somewhere. Well, here's a little experiment. A little experiment in common sense. You put on black Wellingtons and cross his field, and when you got to the end of the field, you look at his black Wellingtons, it's got red dust on it. Now, where's that red dust come from? Now, as far as this red mud not being toxic, uh, I urge you to have a look at this. They had an experiment in Western Australia where they spread, deliberately spread, red mud on, on the 40 farms. It was an absolute disaster, and you can read that up. There's the website. It's actually on our website, the fluoridealert.org website. And is it toxic? Well, let's look at this. This is a paper written in... Uh, I can't see the date there, 2014. But overall, the red mud has a lot of hazardous elements, such as arsenic, lead, chromium, and mercury. There is the potential environmental risk in long-term storage of red mud. Right in the heart of your Green Valley, a few hundred meters from a company making powdered milk sent to China. One day the Chinese are going to find out and they're not going to be happy about it. Here's another paper and uh, blowing up a little bit here. Uh, huge, uh, these two kinds of red mud can also be found. The comparison composition shows that the calcium carbonate content in sintering red mud is higher. Bayer red mud has more hazardous elements such as arsenic, lead and mercury and both have a high concentration of radioactivity. And that dust is blowing into your fields. There should be a criminal investigation into the people that determined that that facility could go there. And another investigation as to the government officials who continue to allow it to be there. Has the alumina plant and the red mud stories put limerick on the slippery slope of becoming a sacrifice area? Well, if the Irish cement plan to burn waste in the cement kiln uh, goes ahead, I suggest it is. This will be the second downwards step. Let me say this. You know, when people talk about jobs, everybody wants jobs, everybody wants economic development. But the moment you cash in your environment, you've cashed in your last card. It's the last card you have to use is a clean environment. When you get rid of that, everything else goes to pop. Now I'm going to go through the arguments against burning waste in cement kilns. Number one, it's not sustainable. Let me explain. Look. Here it is. There's that linear economy again. If you burn the waste, all those materials, all those products that you burn, you've got to go all the way back to the beginning and make them all over again. Which means you've got to extract more raw materials, you've got to transport, you've got to move manufacture back to square one. You haven't moved a step towards sustainability. When you burn your discarded materials, we do not mitigate the global impacts of extraction, manufacture, or transport. Incineration in cement kilns is business as usual when our planet cannot afford business as usual. We're talking about all the energy you use, we're talking about the solid waste, uh, the air pollution, the water pollution at both extraction and manufacture. Look at that word solid waste. Solid waste from manufacture. What have you got? in those red mud ponds. This is a classic example of the enormous amount of waste you produce in manufacture from raw materials. Now that's the bad news. Here's the good news. When you recycle materials back to industry, you cut out all the impacts of extraction and the impacts of transporting what you've extracted from source to home. So yes, there is a mitigation of global impacts. Better still, if you reuse the whole object, you cut out the impacts of both extraction and manufacture. So reuse is a lot better than recycling, if you can do it. And then organics. Every time that you can or compost 
and get that material back into the soil, you're saving an enormous amount of money and energy from not using a certain amount of fertilizers. And there's so many other reasons to compost. But you're doing that, that's good. It's a waste of energy. Oh, I mean, this is, this is where it gets a bit ironic. They call these facilities, incinerators, waste to energy facilities. But actually, they are a waste of energy. Far more energy is saved the globe by reusing, recycling, and composting. That's where the energy is saved. Four times more. Uh, what you cannot get back when you burn stuff, what you can't get back is the embedded energy. The energy you've used in extraction, the energy you've used in transport, the energy you've used in manufacture cannot come back to you by burning. All you get when you burn is a little bit, 25% of, no, actually more in the cement kiln, maybe 75% of the calorific value in your paper and plastics. But it's a waste of, of energy. Let's have a look at this chart here. This compares the amount of energy you get if you recycled a ton of this material on the left. The yellow column is how much energy you would get if you used an incinerator to make electricity. And notice that the one I've outlined, PET, polyethylene terephthalate, a common plastic, the plastic of plastic bottles. Uh, 26 times more energy is saved by recycling that material than, than burning it and producing electricity. Uh, incineration is a threat to the health of cement kilns, the health of the local residents. That's why most of you are here, I'm sure. Here are two technical documents that represent the spectrum of, of views on the health issues. Here's one that says they're very dangerous and a big threat to health. This is by Kleppinger and somebody else, Cairns, Cairns. That's quite old, 1990. And here is uh, the view of industry. And to be fair to yourself, you should read both sides. Uh, come to agree with judgment. Now, what is clear is that uh, incineration and cement kilns put toxic metals into the air. The, the metals that go in there, into the air, mercury, cadmium, lead, thallium. These are low melting point metals and they are easily vaporized or come out as very tiny particles. So this is a big issue. So looking at the toxic metals. Well, here's the schematic of a cement kiln. And so the first concern is what is going up into the air? How much of these volatile metals go into the air? And to answer that question, you say, well, how sophisticated is the air pollution control equipment? And the air pollution control equipment for making cement is pretty crude. An electrostatic precipitate. These, these went out of favor as far as a modern trash incinerator many years ago. So they are going to go into the air, period. But it's worse. If you notice the small print underneath the electrostatic precipitator towards the top, it says dust recycling. Dust recycling. Instead of doing the obvious thing, which is once you've captured these toxic substances and you've got them in this ash, then you sequester the ash. You find a safe place to put the ash, you may even stabilize it beforehand. That's what you do. You've, you've, you've got a sink. You've captured these toxic metals. Well done. Now look after it. But what do they do? They put it back into the process. They call it ash recycling. It's, it's an, an insult to the word recycling to call this recycling. They, put, they completely subvert the whole mission of a pollution control device. So there's only two places now where those toxic metals can go. Either into the cement or into the air. There's no other place for it because you haven't taken the sink that you've created and put that in a safe place. So let's talk about the ash. What we're talking about the ash. 
There's two kinds of ash that are produced in an incinerator. Bottom ash, which falls through the grate, and fly ash, which is captured in the air pollution control devices. And to, to show you how much more seriously the incinerator industry is about this process than the cement kilns are, more money is spent on the air pollution control than the rest of the, the technology put together. Most of your money spent on a modern trash incinerator goes into air pollution control device. But the cement kiln, they just put it back into the cement. To show you how toxic the fly ash, in Germany and Switzerland, they put the fly ash into nylon bags and put those into salt mines. That's the same thing they do, as they do with low-level radioactive waste in, in Germany. In Japan, some of the incinerators vitrify the ash, make it into a glass. Now, we have a letter, or at least uh, Claire has a letter. She asked what Irish cement was going to do with the, with the flyers. She had the show. And the answer from Irish cement is as follows. The cement factory does not produce fly, fly ash. In other words, I mean, one way of interpreting that is they don't have any air pollution control device, because if you have an air pollution control device, you better get some fly ash, otherwise the bloody thing is useless. And he goes on, the best way to explain it is to consider the purpose of a cement factory and the purpose of an incinerator. The purpose of an incinerator is to destroy waste, which it does at high temperature, leaving behind the ash. The ash, now here, when he says that, he's talking about bottom ash. But the question is, what do you do with fly ash? I'm a bit worried now, because if you're one of your people that's making public statements does not know the difference between bottom ash and fly ash, we have a real problem. The ash that remains is, this is the bottom ash now, the ash that remains is the inorganic or mineral fraction of the waste that do not burn and is typically sent off-site for further processing or treatment. Correct. Now, the purpose of a cement factory is just that. It is a factory making cement. 100% of our raw materials are minerals from the natural rock. These minerals provide the chemistry for our final cement. They already exist inside the natural rock, and the job of our factory is to rearrange these minerals into a new form that ensures a more consistent and predictable performance when the cement is used to make concrete. Okay, nice. These minerals from the rock do not burn, but at extreme temperatures inside our cement kiln, they melt. And the ash or minerals from the combustion of the fuel, now he's talking about the bottom ash, but of course it will also include the fly ash because they recycle the fly ash as well back into the kiln. Whether from fossil or alternative fuels, which is generated at these extreme temperatures inside the cement kiln, also melts and fuses with our raw materials to become part of our clinker. Approximately 1% of our raw materials arises in this way from the ash in the fuel. In other words, all the toxic elements that are used in all the commercial products that end up in our lives and that end up shredded and pushed into this incinerator are going to end up in the cement, or worse, into the air. None of it is tracked. None of it is sequestered. None of it is looked after like responsible incinerators. Now, talking about the, the dioxin problem, I have more to say about that a bit later. The emissions of dioxin in cement kilns, even within a few hours, can change by a factor of 80. And of course, these dioxin emissions will go into the air because that electrostatic precipitate is not going to remove very many of them. They're not using activated charcoal to scavenge the dioxins, and they're not using particulate control that's going to get most of those dioxins. These emissions will increase with upset conditions and during startup and shutdown. You need continuous sampling. I don't know what the cycling, uh, the, the monitoring regime is for this factory. I don't know if there's anybody that's independently making measurements of dioxin or toxic metals. I don't know. 
Uh, I've heard that the EPA uh, uh, lets them know when they're coming. Uh, they monitor themselves, I'm told. This is ridiculous. Measurements made under ideal conditions and by the company, no. You need independent monitoring. It's misleading to compare the concentrations of dioxin, etc., with other combustion sources because of the huge volume of gases that come through these things. It's a huge volume. So if you only look at concentration, you're missing the point. What is the total quantity of toxic material that's coming out of the stack? How much dioxin? How much toxic metals? Um, if you can't get continuous two-week sampling, that's the so-called AMESA system which is commercially available, that's the idea. Uh, so we've got to find out what their system is of monitoring. What we need is a, a two-week monitoring. You put in a probe, you collect a sample for two weeks. Then you put another probe in and collect another sample for two weeks. And you do that for 52 weeks, 26 measurements. And from that you can gauge your total output. This is commercially available, it's used in Germany and in Belgium. Oh, and the other thing, if you can't get that, and in addition to that, I would say, you need to monitor the environment. You need to carefully monitor cow's milk for dioxin. An absolute must in the area. If there's no problem, you shouldn't see any increase in dioxin in the, in the cow's milk. And you should also do the same for mother's milk, particularly the mother's milk that live very close to that facility. And that's quite expensive. But it's an absolute minimum if you want to do something as silly as burning waste in a cement kiln. This is what the price you're going to have to pay. The other thing you could do, which is a lot cheaper, is to monitor uh, metals in children's hair, in hair. And that's cheap. Maybe $25 to $50 a shot to measure the complete metal uh, analysis of the children's hair in the, in the area. And there's another thing you can do, which would be ideal in this area, because I've seen you've got moss and lichens on all your rocks. Moss and lichens are very good scavengers for mercury. And so you need to collect those, the moss, get a baseline data, and see how that mercury changes with time in the moss and lichens near the, the plant. And these things I'm telling you now are things that you can do as a, as a community. It, you don't want to have to do this. You don't want them to burn the waste, but if they do do it, you need some defense. Some defense which is going to stand up in a court of law and in the court of public opinion. So again, in, in cement kilns, both the bottom ash and this one, the, both the bottom ash and the fly ash is going into the cement. Now a few more words about other pollutants. The, the new compounds that are uh, produced in the burning process, dioxins and furans, related compounds. You are hostage to how well the plant is run. From what we've heard already from Mary and others, it doesn't look too good on that front. They're housekeeping. Secondly, how well is the plant monitored? And from what I've seen, they don't seem to be very forthcoming on how they are monitoring and how they plan to monitor. <laughs> And lastly, how aggressively your government enforces regulations. And that's where people usually grow. You need three things to protect the public from emissions from any burning source. You need strong regulations, you need adequate monitoring, and you need tough enforcement. If any one of those three is weak, then you are not protected. Let me say it again. If any one of those is weak, you and your family and your community is not protected. And the way you go forward under those circumstances is not to allow this practice to go forward. Use every political string that you can pull. Now, as far as monitoring is concerned, there are some things that we can monitor and regulate. There are other things which we can't actually do that physically. Um, there is no monitoring of nanoparticles. These are particles less than one micron. 
They're very tiny, and that's where a lot of your toxic metals and dioxins are going to be on those tiny particles. Uh, the regulations, the regulations for incinerators is 10 microns. That's what they regulate. And it may go down to 2.5 microns in some countries. But the particles that we're concerned about are these nanoparticles. These are literally the most toxic thing that comes out of an incinerator. And here's some of the problems. Nanoparticles are not efficiently captured by air pollution control devices, certainly not electrostatic precipitates. Uh, they travel long distances, and I look from that plane today, and you see how flat, how it was stretched for miles. You've got mountains at the very edge which will trap everything in a bowl under certain senses. These particles are so tiny, they remain suspended. They don't go to ground by gravity. They're so tiny, they go to ground by a phenomenon called Brownian motion. So they remain suspended for a long time. And they penetrate deep into the lungs, these tiny particles. But worse than that, they are so small, they evade the first defense of the body. They go through any membrane. These particles are so tiny, they squeeze between the proteins and lipids which make up the membrane, both in the lung membrane and the gastrointestinal tract. So within a microsecond, these particles are in your bloodstream and they are circulating to every tissue in the body. And here is a particle in brain tissue, brain tissue. Now, if you want to pursue this further in terms of technology, how they're produced, uh, and also in terms of health. There's two sources I would recommend. There's a paper by Stefania Cormier in Environmental Health Perspectives from 2006. A very important paper. And Vivian Howard, who lives in Coleraine in Northern Ireland, testified in the Ringer Skiddy uh, Waste to Energy Facility, a brilliant 30-page presentation on the relationship between dioxins and health and incineration. And I have seen no scientific response from the industry to either Cormier's paper or Howard's uh, presentation. Very important. If anybody wants Howard's paper, it's on my laptop. I can share it with you if you have a thumb drive, or I can send it to you if you give me your email. Now, here's another issue. As you know, the stuff that comes out of these long uh, cylinders, these rotating kilts, uh, is clinker, lumps, lumps of the, what will, build, will become cement. But what you have to do when you've got those lumps is to grind them down to a fine dust. And of course, that fine dust is going to be highly toxic if you're using waste to make the cement. Now, we know from facilities, depending upon their, their, the quality of their housekeeping, that dust gets into workers' lungs, it gets onto their clothes and skin, and into the surrounding environment. They can take it back to their families when they bring their clothes back. And if you've ever visited a cement kiln, uh, perhaps you can confirm this, but in my experience, when you get close to the incinerator, you'll see dust. You'll see dust on leaves, on trees, on pavements, on windshields, and so on. Now, what you've got to remember is you're breathing that dust if you live locally, and that dust is going to be toxic if they use waste as a fuel. Now, I'm opposed to waste incineration in purpose-built facilities. I'm opposed to it. So even if you came to me with the best incinerator that you could find, I would still fight it. But I've got to say, this is a different... This takes the issue one step uh, different. When you burn the waste in cement kilns, you are taking it out of the hands of professionals and giving it to amateurs. And I don't mean to be unkind by that. The people that run cement kilns, their job is to make cement. He told you that. Their job is to make cement. They have little experience of handling waste and little knowledge of the exquisite toxicity of something like dioxin, which is toxic at parts per trillion levels. So your engineers that run these things have no idea. For them, a part per million would be good. But a part per trillion is a million times smaller than a part per million. And that's what you've got to control for. 
That's what the professionals try to do. This is good business for the cement company, uh, company, but it's not good for the health of the community. As I've already mentioned, instead of paying for their fuel, somebody's going to pay them to take the fuel. What a deal! And the more toxic that waste is, the more they will get paid. So the economic reality is that there would be, if they're only interested in money and greed, then the push will be to eventually make this a hazardous, receiving hazardous waste. Even as it is, they're talking about solvents, they're talking about tires and, and household waste, which contains a lot of toxins. Now, it's one thing, I know the workers are concerned here about the possibility of losing jobs. But it's one thing for workers to take risks with their own health. It's quite another thing if the bargain is that they have to risk their children's health and their grandchildren's health. That's a different, different gamble for the workers. And I want to explain what I'm talking about here. What are the major health concerns of dioxin? Dioxins accumulate in animal fat. This is a calculation that I did with Tom Webster in 1987. One liter of cow's milk gives you as much dioxin as breathing the air next to the cow for eight months. Eight months of breathing. You don't have to live near the cement kiln to get the dioxin. You just have to eat food that's produced uh, close to the facility, even this over the whole valley, maybe. A German study found this. In one day, a grazing cow puts as much dioxin into its body as a human being would get in 14 years of breathing. In other words, if you were prepared for this boring life, you'd have to stand in that field with the grazing cow for 14 months and breathe the air to get the same amount of dioxin that that cow would get in one day. You see, this is something to bear in mind. We normally protect ourselves from facilities like this with stacks, chimneys. What's the purpose? To dilute, to disperse. What does nature do? It reconcentrates. It reconcentrates mercury in fish. It reconcentrates dioxin in animal fat, in beef, in cows, in, in goats, in sheep, in rabbits, in chickens. Reconcentrates. Dioxins steadily accumulate in human body fat. Now the man cannot get rid of dioxin. It steadily accumulates in his body over a whole lifetime. If you measure it, you'll see the dioxin levels going up over 70 or 80 years. But a woman can get rid of the dioxin in her fat by having a baby. If she has a baby, she, the, the dioxin that she's accumulated for 20, 21, 25 years moves to the fetus in nine months comes out of the body fat and it is given to the, the fetus. So the fetus gets the highest dose of dioxin of any uh, age range in our society. And when the baby is born, then the mother continues to give the dioxin to her baby through her breast milk. Now this was so serious um, well, uh, first let me explain why it's serious. Dioxin interferes with six different hormonal systems. It interferes with thyroid hormones, which means it can impact intellectual development. It interferes with sex hormones, and it means it can interfere with sexual development. Uh, Linda Birnbaum wrote this article in 1995, which goes into all the developmental problems that dioxin can cause. In a language it's easier to understand, Theo Coburn, who passed away a couple of years ago, wrote this book, Our Stolen Future, goes into the whole issue of endocrine disruption and why it's such a threat to the future. It's such a threat that the Institute of Medicine in the United States came up with a plan to reduce dioxin in the food supply, or in our bodies, to strategies to decrease exposure. They wrote, Fetuses and breastfeeding infants may be at particular risk from exposure to dioxin-like compounds due to their potential to cause adverse neurodevelopmental, neurobehavioral, 
and immune system effects in developing systems. Their recommendation, the committee recommends that the government place a high public health priority on reducing dioxin-like compounds intakes by girls and young women in the years well before pregnancy. Don't wait for the girl to be pregnant and having a baby when you start reducing your exposure, stop ex getting exposure to, to dioxin. And to do this, they recommended substituting low fat or skim milk for whole milk and foods lower in animal fat. Now, this is surely, dr surely draconian to get to the point of saying that half the population should change its diet dramatically to reduce um, fat from, from animals. It's pretty draconian. And we are brought to this level because of the past generations that built incinerators everywhere. And that's what we have to stop. We have to learn from our past mistakes and don't build these damn things anymore. But even if we made incinerators or cement kilns burning waste safe, we would never make them sensible. Incineration is attempting to perfect our bad idea. Our task in the 21st century is not to find better ways to destroy discarded materials, but to stop making packaging and products that have to be destroyed. Waste is a design problem which brings me back now to the 10 steps to zero waste. I'm assuming that you're familiar with all the first four steps. So let me go to step five, which is my favorite. This is reuse and repair centers, which I want to be in the future community centers, community centers, which put an emphasis on living our lives around people and not around things we buy because it's shown on television. We need relationships, not consumption of products. Reuse and repair centers, which we want to become community centers. Example, urban ore in Berkeley. This has been running for 30 years. It grosses $3 million a year, and it's, there are 27 full-time, well-paid jobs. When you go in, it's like a second-hand shopping mall. This jacket came from a reuse and repair center. This belt came for $5, and this belt for $2 also came from such a facility. Uh, building materials are very valuable items in these operations. Doors, appliances, furniture, and in this one in Burlington, Vermont, they uh, actually train people. They take people off the street and in nine months train them to repair large appliances, small appliances, electrical goods, or computers, one or the other. And after nine months, I give them a certificate and help them to get a job. This is good. Employment. They also link to a deconstruction operation where they take down old buildings in the reverse order they went up. Some of the materials are good enough to use again in new buildings and some of the wood is so beautiful it can be made into new furniture, beautiful furniture. Sweden has go, gone one step further. There's two things that you need to protect in, in Ireland in my view, tourism and agriculture. Tourism and agriculture, and this is now a great idea for tourism uh, to Green Island, not the muddy brown one, but the Green Island should have a reuse park. When you go in, the band is playing to welcome you. When you go around, there are clowns to entertain the kids. When you go to the toilet, it's an art gallery. You can choose a painting on the wall. And this is my favorite. This is the famous separating dog. This dog can separate mixed recyclables into six different categories. Exciting. If a dog can do that, surely we can get humans to separate into three. <laughs> Step six, very important. Economic incentives, I think you do have something similar to this. This is the save as you throw system. The compostables are picked up for free, the recyclables are free, but the residuals, uh, the less you make, the more you save. The less you make, the more you save. Now, the way it works in Capanari in Italy is everybody has a reusable bag to put in the residuals, but you only pay, it's got a microchip in it, you only pay when you put it out. So if you don't put it out for a month, you don't pay for a month. Other waste reduction initiatives in, in Italy, um, this is Rossano Ercolini that's organized most of my trips to Italy. He is a, 
a school teacher, a primary school teacher. And here are some of his primary students, and he's taken all the plastic out and said he's using glass, ceramics, and stainless steel. Imagine how much waste you could reduce if you did that in every school, in every university, every institution in Ireland. Get rid of all that plastic crap. And this is a zero waste baby. This baby uses reusable panellini, reusable pampers, diapers. So how close are we getting to zero waste around the world with these first seven steps I've talked about? In San Francisco, population 850,000, very little space. 50% was diverted from landfill, not using incineration. Um, by 2000, by 2011, they pushed that up to 8%. Their goal for 2020 is very close. So San Francisco is the best model in the world for a city that's getting close to zero waste. In Italy, in Italy, and who would have thought that Italy would lead the world in zero waste? In a, a big environmental movement. Over a thousand communities are achieving over 70% diversion in Italy. Over 300 are over 80% and some are even over 90%. And they're doing this very quickly. So now the question is, and most, I think most communities would be pretty darn happy with 80% diversion. But for the purists out there that say, that's not zero waste, going beyond 80%. To do that, we need step eight. And step eight is in two parts. You first need a residual separation facility, low tech, built in front of the landfill. They have these in Nova Scotia. There's the residual separation facility, the stuff that they can't recycle, or didn't end up in the recycling or compost. Now you notice that the road does not go to the landfill, the road only goes to the facility. So nobody can dump directly into the landfill. That's your first defense against the mafia, or the mob, or the crooks. Um, right, when the contain it. This is what it looks like from the air. In that first building they separate. In the second building they compost the dirty organic fraction. Then they stabilize it further outside and then it goes to the landfill behind. So on conveyor belts workers pull out more recyclables, more toxics, and the dirty organic fraction is not touched, goes all the way to the end of the conveyor belt, is shredded, goes into troughs, it's composted for 18 days. Not to produce a product to sell, but to stabilize it above ground so that when it goes into the landfill, it doesn't cause problems underground. And the second part of this is a zero waste research center where you study, somebody studies the non-recyclable fraction of bad industrial design, and we need local universities, professors, and students to be part of that research operation. The message to industry that the com community delivers via this mechanism, you've already heard. The zero waste then is a combination of community responsibility, the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, and compost, which you started big time here, and then industrial responsibility, which is redesign. And we reckon we can get 80% from community responsibility, but to whittle away at that last 20%, we need uh, industrial responsibility. Zero waste is a new direction. And we need to redesign. We need to redesign products. And that we can do at the reuse and repair center. I mean, that's where you're going to get the broken products. The built-in obsolescence, etc. that we need to study. And redesign packaging. And most of the packaging you're going to see in the residual facility. So there's two places where the reuse can take place. But the goal is the same. Better industrial design. Who was the first person in the world to talk about zero waste? Anybody? Henry Ford. Uh, that's a good suggestion, Henry Ford. Yeah, he was pretty good. Um, no, it was Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci said there's no such thing as waste. And if you notice with his inventions and his art, nature was always his guide. You know, the, the bird wing as a model for a plane or a helicopter, whatever he was thinking of. And he obviously observed that nature makes no waste. That's our job. Our arrogant species has to get better 
or get as, try to get as close to nature's methods as we possibly can. We're going in the opposite direction with genetic engineering and uh, a lot of modern medicine. We need better industrial design, that's step nine. We need an interim landfill, one that's the object is to get less and less material going into the landfill year by year so that by 2030 or some given date we've got very little going in. And what I like about this is it starts with everybody. Everybody has these ten things. Everybody has this first step to do. But by the time we get to steps eight and nine we are drawing on the brightest minds in our society. We're drawing on our professors and our students and our industrial designers. And we need those guys because we need to link zero waste with other aspects of sustainability. There's some obvious ones. We can link zero waste with sustainable agriculture through composting. And we can link to sustainable architecture with deconstruction and reuse and repair. That have our architects studying uh, building in reverse. Summarizing, this 10-step ten step plan is better for the economy, more jobs, more social justice. It's better for our health. It's less toxics. It's better for our universities, more meaning, more relevance. It's better for our planet. It's more sustainable. And it's better for our children because it offers them more hope for the future. And I have a little song to sing, but I'll leave that to when we need a humorous break. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I, and again, I would just remind you, this is, in my view, such a positive working towards the future. It's so positive. And that, uh, but incineration, cement kilns, they are huge obstacles to this. So you not only want to stop that cement kiln because it's going to poison your children, but you want to stop it because it's going to ruin the planet. Thank you very much. Give me a point. Uh, we're going to have a short question and answer session just after this, and we take a few questions at a time. But before we get to that, there's a sign up sheet which some of you will have seen coming in the door. You can sign up for more information. But if you've been enthused by what you've heard here if, and you want to help out, please give as many details as you can. There's a box to take that you should be contacted, and you know, use block capitals to make it easier for us to read your details if you want to sign up for that. The, uh, questions will start in a while. Just to point out, you probably noticed that this is being recorded. If you're happy enough to be on camera, you can give a nod to the cameraman and you pan around. Otherwise, he, the camera will be on the stage, basically, so it'll just be the audio. So, um, we'll probably take three or four questions at a time and then answer them. If, rather than do one at a time, because we want to kind of keep conscious of the time and not have all our time on one question and leave anybody out. Okay? So I'll pass around the... moving like this. <coughs> You're going to do the raffle raffle before everybody goes? I know, I think we do it at the end. We do the raffle at the end then. It's oh, just it's a way of keeping people... For people who can... <laughs> we were giving tickets on the way for to, to win a copy of Mr. Connor's book. Okay. Okay. Hi, Paul. Uh, thank you very much for coming. And uh, it was a great talk. Um, you mentioned uh, this one question I wanted to, well, there's many questions I want to ask, but uh, this one question you uh, mentioned uh, the cement factory talk about jobs, and you know, they, they, they obviously have an argument. They obviously have an argument for, for why they're doing this and the benefits they're bringing to the city um, and bringing to you know, our, the economy that talk about jobs. And, uh, you know, I'm just wondering about the idea of contacting the business, business that will be affected by this. 
Yes. You mentioned, for example, the dairy industry, yeah. farming industry, the tourist industry, and I'm sure there's many others. You could probably give us a list. Um, are, are these people aware of the effects and the damage that the cement factory and what they're doing would be um, doing, to, uh, doing to their business? And, you know, I'm sure an approach would be to actually, uh, you know, inform them and direct them to what's going on. Yeah. No, that is a, a very, oh, okay. Because okay. we're going to take, yeah. we're going to take a few. Oh, if you're at a time, yeah. Okay. But meanwhile, it's good. Uh, so I'll take a question. Is there anything? There's a gentleman over here. And a chap behind him in a blue jacket as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't know whether anybody's aware here that we have stopped two incinerators here in County Limerick. Uh, one of them was on the Dock Road. I had a terrible battle with it. And the other one was at Krukora. And uh, we won in both cases. It was a very, very different thing. And Doctor, it's wonderful to hear you up there talking the things that I was talking in those days. And that's a long time ago. Uh, I won the, the, the Thing. Actually, I had several life-threatening things. One fellow came up to me with a knife to slip my head and to slip my throat because I was fighting him. So we are up against a big battle. The tough people is these uh, industrious Willie or Dee will remember uh, the battle we had. And uh, <laughs> I don't know which side he was on. But, well, um, so one question I was asked, you said you stopped 300 in America. We've stopped two here in Limerick, and now we're fighting the third. Uh, could you say how you stopped the three and only let one through? We don't want to let this one through. Yeah. I want to make it clear that I've never stopped an incinerator in my life, me personally. Uh, the, the role of myself and other experts is best understood like this. Affecting change is like driving a nail through a piece of wood. The expert sharpens the nail, gives the citizens ammunition. But we cannot push that nail through the piece of wood. You need the hammer of public opinion to drive that nail home. So that's the function I have to, to arm you, to give you as much information as I can. But you've got to use it. It, it, I will not be able to persuade your government or anybody with power to do this. It's got, they've got to see uh, a community organized and mobilized, and they've got to know that you are going to give them a lot of problems in the future if they don't help you. Um, it's, and and I, I must say that you've got a wonderful team here. I, I, was, I had dinner last night with Angus wasn't there, but everybody, most of the organizers were there. Really impressive. You've got a great cross-section of the community in terms of age, in terms of sex, in terms of, of skills, experience. You've got a great organizing team. And with the number of people that you have in this room, as you know, if you had got this many at your meetings, you would have been pleased. Uh, you can do it. You really can do it. And I stand by to, to help in any way I can, okay, from, a, from afar. Okay. Um, uh, well, maybe we'll yeah, do his... we answer yeah. the second question. We answer this gentleman's. Uh, then, and this, the gentleman in blue uh, over here is next, and then this man, the, the man beard, and then this lady as well as indicated. Is that Jack Sullivan? Is that Jack Sullivan? No, no, he's not there. No, no. Sorry. Okay, your question is great. Absolutely key strategy. I remember when I've been to Ireland a dozen times, I think, and, and many times I've met with farmers. They are key. The agricultural industry has the most to lose with this. We need to meet with them. You, this is where your power is going to be powerful. The tourist industry, absolutely. The fishing industry um, and clean industries. Clean industries that want to live in a clean environment. Uh, and there are... You know, some of the best things in zero waste are happening in industry. They're progressive companies like uh, Xerox. Xerox is recovering 95% of the materials in the machines. They're doing it in Don Talk. They're doing it in Vendrade, Netherlands. So there are good industries out there. You want clean industries here. Clean ones. 
that are compatible with the two, the tourism and agriculture. But meanwhile, that's where to flex your muscles. Because the politicians, one, they can count. But boy, they count even more if you've got a few industries in there as well. Why aren't this here tonight? What's that? Why, what, do they just not know about this? Uh, yeah, we, we, we don't know. No, we, we, we can... The important thing is, this has been captured on videotape. Yeah. So even if someone didn't have time to come tonight, you can make multiple copies of that videotape. And when you go to a meeting with the Chief Executive Office, you give it to them. Uh, Dr. Khan is an expert on the topic, but he says he's not from here, so he hasn't been doing the organizing, so that question is probably more better directed at us. We have contacted farmers, we've contacted the IFA, and we've been in contact with other, uh, other industries as well. Now, some individual farmers are very concerned about this, especially one who is actually quite close to the factory, but they also are under pressure from the factory. And you also have the issue of uh, not wanting to admit there's a problem with a product you're selling. So one of the things, we mentioned the pressure we put on our side is one is both, but the other is consumers. You vote every day when you take you know, those coloured bits of paper out of your pocket. So if, if they know that you won't buy it, if, if it's polluted, they'll keep their livelihood and they'll pressure. Let them know as consumers that you're aware of this threat to the product and that you will choose to buy it elsewhere if, if it goes ahead. So, back to that, we, we have tried to find out, if there are other people out there, because we're a small voluntary committee, if there are other people out there who have better connections in these industries than we do, you know, you're more than welcome to, to join in and, and try to help us influence them better. You know, otherwise it's, it's down to consumer power as well. Um, okay, Cam. Uh, yeah, Carl Cross, my name, I'm a Clare County Councillor and uh, I've been asked by a few people uh, in the run-up to this this week to come in and speak. Um, I've been kept abreast of all of this by my friend William Lee and one or two people on the committee have been in touch with me also. And pollution doesn't follow county boundaries and the communities that I represent would be um, around the South Clare area, right up to the city boundary. Uh, but if we take the communities of Cracklow and Melik, there's only a river separating them. And with two or three kicks of a ball, you're in Castlemonger to the sack close. So Castlemonger is the nearest community and Raheen and so on. But we would be quite close to two. And out in that area, there's two uh, groups of feeling. There's the general apathy, because I think we get tricked quite regularly that we have to come all the way into Candela Road and the Dock Road and go all the way out again. It feels quite peripheral at times. But then when you go on your phone and look at your Google Earth and, and zoom up, we're only a matter of fields away from this proposed incinerator. And it's very grave, and I think the, 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 the fallout from this, and the airborne pollutants, as I said, will not follow county boundaries. Uh, they, when they're, once they're airborne and in the sky, uh, they will be falling, either by rain or by dust, on fields and communities on both sides of the river. Uh, just a few short weeks ago, to maybe brief people in the room, we had a, a motion in Clare County Council uh, to take Limerick County Council to a board plan all, which would have been unprecedented. And we were in the balance of having that vote just carried, and at the last minute it was amended. Uh, all of it was not lost. Clare County Council is currently preparing a large case file to take Limerick County Council and Irish Cement. Uh, <coughs> we're about to drag them through the Environmental Protection Agency and we've never done that as a county council. Uh, the county council systems predate Irish independence. They're over 100 years old, and this has never happened before, but we're prepared to do it in Clare. Uh, it has been a proverbial two fingers to the people of Limerick what their own county council and planning department did to them. And I'm speaking as someone... Uh, I again, you could say I'm speaking from afar, and it's easy to speak when I'm uh, over the border in Clare, but I have seen, uh, you know, the two communities, we, we go over and across that border every day, each one of us in the room does, and I have seen Limerick make huge strides forward, they're pitched for the city of culture, Limerick 2030, and then to shoot the entire city and county in foot with this horrendous project. Um, so we are going to go the Environmental Protection Agency route, we see this as very serious. There's a few things I just want to, by way of questioning, if that's okay at the end. Um, we have been told, and I, I've been briefed by someone in the last week who has worked 
uh, most of his life on incinerators, the hard engineering of them. And we have been told in Clare that Repack Ireland currently, if you go to any of the tyre replacement uh, units around the city here, you will pay three euro per tyre to have it recycled, and I think that goes to Repack Ireland. So the estimation we have been given is that uh, each tyre that goes to Castle Mungret, it will first of all, it will bring the bill currently for coal and coal materials down to nil, and then they will bring them into a profit of about 24 million per annum. Uh, so it's not all about you know reducing carbon footprint and all. It's about driving new profits. Now that's the prerogative of all companies. We don't dispute that. Uh, one thing I think would be very beneficial, and maybe the, the committee might take this on board, would be um, I'm a primary school teacher by day, and quite recently we were talking about the Chernobyl accident. And I'm not trying to equate the two because that would be alarmist. But uh, there's a fantastic picture in some of the school textbooks. And it has one of these, you can almost imagine a map, and there's coloured circles which show the extent of the airborne pollutants. And I think for a few weeks, that should be, if the committee could manage it, in the Limerick Leader and Clare Champion, to show people the extent that within a three kilometre range, the pollutant factor would be 60 or 70 percent airborne, and diluted downward from that. And we've been hearing that the airborne pollutants of this would be in the air for a 30 kilometre radius. So maybe the committee might just clarify some of that. I'm trying to stoke up. Um, some response to this in Clare amongst the public, but as I began at the outset, there's a feeling of apathy and huge anger. But as a representative role in Clare, as in the Clare County Council, we are on a head on, head on collision with Limerick County Council. We pass absolutely no apology. Uh, they get the two fingers to their own county people when they pass this decision. They had zero consultation with us across the river, and if there has to be a collision course, then so be it. It's in the public interest. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been with the cycling business for the last 16 years, and I've been pleased with the cycling business in the county here with tires, glass, and pair of plastics. Now, we manufacture products out of every day. I never believe in taking away to put it into a dump. So we are in a factor. Everything we say here. Now, if you live in the land to open 90,000 tonne of tyres a year, that's 9 million tyres. And repack EMT are the people that are charged with compliance in that operation. And they're going to pay approximately 3 euro per tyre. That's 27 million a year. I have seen it themselves state that they will save 55,000 tonnes of imported fuel. And uh, if that's the case, they're going to make a fortune about, about 60 to 70 million a year in a saver, and we'll pay for the public side. Now, I put in the precipitators of the Money Pine Power Station and the slower, and we're putting up approximately 200,000 tons a year of Money Pine. And the 600 ton a day of fly out of the money pile coming in here to the cement factory to be mixed in the cement. And the carbon content in the cement is so bad, all of you will take off your shoes and walk into the concrete and you'll end up with two bottom legs. Because I tried it. Now, in our fairness, there's enough easier to do something about stopping it. There's a top of this great to even think about it. and uh, the prevention of waste and zero waste is really what we're all would like to aim for. But we, the time scale we have is something which needs to be acted upon much more quickly. And how can we mobilise and convince the, 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 the spokespeople for this operation who, are, who seem to be very uh, reluctant to kind of engage with the facts, given the time scale that's in question? Those? And then we'll, we'll have enough and then I'll have to take those three questions and then we'll be thanks. Alright, do you want to take some of those? Uh, 
I didn't understand the... <laughs> okay. Well, going back to something Councillor Crowe said, yeah. uh, a lot of you probably won't be aware, but there is actually already something online that is modeling the distribution of pollutants centered from the cement factory. It's called Plume Plotter. I don't know if we have it. Do we, can we put that on? I'm not sure what that is actually. But it's called Plume Plotter, and if you look for that, it, it takes a live feed of the wind direction uh, over Limerick and models the distribution of various pollutants, how far they would spread, and it has concentric circles of, of, of distance from the cement factory. That's one thing. Um, the, this gentleman here spoke about the savings from the tyres, and it's true that we're making money from that. And to tie in with something that was said about the carbon, the, the, you know, that climate change is very important for all of us, and we've heard uh, Iris Smith mention about the reduction of carbon. For one thing, there's some dodgy kind of on that, but also the fact is that any carbon dioxide savings made by that plant, or even claimed by it, that's not a saving to the atmosphere, because there's this huge system of carbon trading where they can sell on, they get a huge allowance from EPA, they sell on that allowance, that license to pollute that amount of carbon dioxide. And they're making about 16 million a year at the minute. They uh, just setting those on. So it's, it's still going to be burned somewhere else. They'll sell it to another polluter and it will still go into our atmosphere. So that's another aspect to look at. It's just a nail that it's, they're not doing something that is done elsewhere because it's done elsewhere with better technology and better regulation. And they're also not saving the climate because they're setting on the, the, the license to burn that, that, that tonnage of carbon dioxide as well. Um, now, the question on this slide here, as I understand it was how can we convince the spokesman for our cement? Um, that's something that we thought of a while back as well, but you kind of have to come to the rather cynical realisation that uh, Mr. Gilmore's job relies on him not agreeing with us. If, uh, so, that's not going to happen. <laughs> They're determined to do this. His bosses want this to go ahead, uh, regardless of what we think of it. So it's not, it's not going to be a case we sit down and talk about it with them. They, they, they can only be stopped by us making them stop. Um, now, James has an announcement, and then it's the gentleman directly behind you, and then the lady next to you, our next set of questions. Thanks. Uh, just a few words to say. My name is James from Limit Against Pollution. I'm a local teacher and uh, industrial at uh, the Irish Cement Factories, which is the Stones Show. I teach things, kids actually. Um, and I just want to say a few words here to encourage you to help fund this campaign here today, to give a good donation. So before you start reaching for your money, I just want to say a few words. Uh, this is a grassroots campaign organised in communities, and we are going up against uh, a corporate joint, you know. And I just want to say a few words on that because it's important to highlight what we're going up against. Uh, this is Ireland's largest corporation, 18 billions of profits, you know. And actually, how they've gotten that wealth and how they've made those profits actually says more about the company than it says actually just about the economic power that they have. Um, I encourage everyone when they go home here today to Google CRH, that's Cement Roadstone Holdings. They own Irish Cement. But when you Google and when you search for this company, Put the words uh, tax fraud, uh, corruption, scandal, um, you know, environmental destruction, illegal dumping. Put them into your search because you name it, this company has been involved in it. Um, from the Moriarty Tribunals, which uh, Irish men were involved in a, a corruption scandal with uh, Charles Holly, from illegally dumping uh, toxic waste on their land in Wicklow for 10 years uh, and didn't face any prosecution. Minister Ross, I don't like Shane Ross at all, um, I find him quite vulgar actually, but he actually said this company has bullied its way into the corporate world, and that's a very uh, apt description. Um, now, how outrageous as their history has been in this country, um, actually more outrageous is that the state and the institutions in this state and the political parties and the governments in the past few decades actually have facilitated their complete lack of disregard for democracy, their complete uh, bullying of communities, or their complete uh, disregard for the environment, and have put uh, the profits of Irish men ahead always 
of the people and the communities that are affected. The EPA never prosecuted them for dumping waste for 10 years. It doesn't uh, enforce its uh, emission controls. And the local council here in Limerick gave them permission uh, a week before our uh, protest, quite cynically actually. So I just think that's really important because we're not just fighting Irish cement actually, we're fighting the entire system who are complicit and are, are on the side and actually are defending Irish cement and giving this license to pollute us, you know. Um, so their greatest asset is money, you know. It's wealth, it's the political parties they can have influence over, and those institutions like the EPA. Our greatest asset is people, or it's people in this room, it's people in the communities that are going to be affected, and the, and the work that the campaign has done so far. And uh, remember, those victories that that man had talked about, we have defeated incinerations in this country. Fermanagh incinerations were defeated. Fracking. We won a frack, not our campaign, but community groups have won a huge victory. Uh, fracking now has been banned in the dollar, which is a dangerous way to extract fossil fuels. That victory didn't fall from the sky, it was from community groups up and down the country fighting against this dangerous way of taking fossil fuels from the ground, you know? So, for every shareholder that stands to profit from this, actually a thousand people will lose out, a hundred thousand people, two hundred thousand people in the city. So I'm asking people here, I know people give a few euros when they come in, um, but I'm asking people to make a silent donation today, can you give 10, 20, 50 euros today, because I'm just going to give you some of the costs we've had. This meeting cost 2,000 euros, to bring over Paul, who's an excellent speaker, I've actually been astounded by some of the stuff he said here today. And to give you an example, the, the, the leaflet that, that you've read, that cost us 320 euros, we produced 10,000 of them, to 200 euros for posters, and this room alone cost us 380 euros. So that's just some of the costs uh, that we've um, incurred, you know. So just please encourage everyone to give a donation now, we're going to pass around a few buckets, because remember, this is an investment into our future, into the children and the, and the schools and the communities that will lose out of this goes ahead. So I'm, I'm asking please sacrifice. We've sacrificed a lot here today and we're asking you to give the same sacrifice today. So I'm just going to pass around some buckets now. Please give generously. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hi, yeah, I just have something to say in relation to the EPA. Um, I can understand in this day and age how CRH, the cement company, can actually get away with monitoring their own uh, level of pollution. If the Environment, Environmental Protection Agency is supposed to do that, how, I mean, what, what is their job? Why are, they, they not, why are they not doing their job? And also, I'd just like to make a point that um, the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, short for SEA, SEAI, they, their main aim is to reduce the amount of carbon emissions that households produce and they have been involved with helping people who can't pay for themselves to have their homes insulated by providing grants, etc. Why is the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland wanting this to be done by reducing carbon emissions, but yet, which, and they are a government agency, but yet um, the EPA aren't doing their jobs, who are also um, a government agency. It just beggars belief that this can happen in this day and age. Can anyone answer it, please? And Dave behind it. Dave behind it. What well, other questions? Can anyone can ask Sorry, just um, a couple of small points. And actually, one of my points uh, kind of to covers the topic that uh, the lady there just asked in terms of the EPA. But so I have a question for uh, Dr. Phone from that. But just a point I want to make. I, I wanted to just commend as well the committee. Uh, and LAP, just generally speaking, who have been doing fantastic work on this issue. I'm uh, living in Dura Doyle, and I moved there October two years ago, and I have encountered the tin film of dust that you encounter almost regularly every morning, and it's just, you don't put your washing out at night just because <laughs> you don't want to wash something twice in a row, you know? Um, and also wanted to extend um, Apologies from uh, Councillor uh, Keen Prendigal, uh, who couldn't be here tonight as well. But a couple of points I wanted to make is just in relation to um, uh, CRH as well. And I think it's, it is interesting because I think the point was made earlier by a man about uh, the workers, the 80 people who are working in the factory. And I think it does need to be addressed the fact that uh, there's been, by Brian Gilmore, a very conscious attempt to divide between the community 
and say the, the people who are working there. And it's quite unnecessary and actually quite cynical and nasty because as was made, higher cement and CRH, the post and pre-tax profits last year in excess of something like 1.7 billion. Like it's a 69% increase in 2016. And for them to be basically saying that they'll close the factory, that they're threatening those jobs, it's a it's a quite a conscious attempt to divide the community. And you, you can see it's quite a cynical effort to try and marginalise uh, an active community campaign that's having success. And I think that's um, something that needs to be called out because it does raise the question of accountability, democratic control and regulation, which flows into the point of the EPA. And what I would like to ask is just a question regards the EPA in America because our EPA um, is very much under the uh, control of corporate interests. You have a, a situation where the chair the head of the EPA in Ireland was appointed by the last Labour and Fine Gael government and follows the same model as in the US because it was uh, Laura Burke, who was a former manager of Indivar, who wanted to build an incinerator in Cork. And she herself said that she does not intend on racing to prosecute any businesses who don't comply with environmental issues because her position is, um, you know, it's she's voluntary for them and actually it's a case of maybe they'll work together, but the key point here is pollution is profit, you know? And the point is, this point about Irish cement, it strikes me, the points that Brian Gilbert makes about the jobs, the profits they're making, it's, it reminds me of a comment by uh, a director of General Motors, when he said, we don't make cars, we make profits. And that's strikes me with the, the interest behind Irish cement in this case. Thank you. Um, Take those questions and have a quick break for the raffle and then to take your questions, sir. Um, in terms of the EPA, now we've been on the phone and emailing them quite a bit and asking them a lot of hard pointed questions and not always being uh, comfortable with the results. Uh, to get back to what Dave was just saying, uh, the other part of the quote that the head of the EPA said was, it's not, it's not our, she doesn't see it as her job to chase companies for the uh, violating environmental regulations, she sees it as a job to support industry and she seems to think that she's appointed to the IEA, the Industrial Development Authority, rather than the EPA. And it is a problem within our regulatory environment that they see themselves as part of the foreign direct investment policy rather than protecting the air that we all breathe. And, you know, because the mistakes of these companies end up in our lungs and our food. We've asked a lot of questions of the EPA, we're not able to speak to the people looking at this license application, they, as a matter of policy, they say they won't talk to either side for a new policy. They would only talk to about enforcement of things that are going on now. And I'll just give a few recent examples, because we did get some information out of them that uh, we made them take those samples and analyze them, and we made sure to tell them to look that they knew we were only giving them half of the samples we took, we'll keep the other side for an independent analysis, lest it accidentally got lost. And so that kind of kept them honest, and it was confirmed independently that you know this was from the factory, which the factory had denied completely. And also, I mean, we're leaving out some of the other people behind this campaign. We've had support from others from public relatives, and also, like we, the, the core bit, there must have been a lot of the residents' associations, some of whom are represented here tonight. Because that is what, at the end of the day, uh, will scare the power. It's not the people at the top table, it's you know, the larger number of residents and, and things like that. They have now taken to a point where there's a text alert system where if there's a blowout, we're all texting each other. Because one complaint will get ignored, and so we think, oh, I complain, but not in sudden this. But when we phoned them, they were complaining about, to us about how many complaints they had got. They'd gotten 500 complaints in the space of a week. But that spurred them to sending up people to do inspections. And then they said, oh, well, we've told them to move some of the dust monitors because the trees had grown out over them. And which prompted the question, you know, trees don't grow overnight. Those trees have been, dust monitors were placed next to younger trees, which over time grew. I mean, if they looked at the dust monitors last year, the year before, the same trees would have been growing over them. But it's only because now there's a pressure on it to enforce it, it's been done. Now, I know at the lower level, the EPA is understaffed, underfunded. You know, um, the staff can only do so much and they would respond to pressure. And at the top level, you know, you've got more complicated things. But 
Believe me, when they got, they were so ticked off at getting 500 emails and phone calls uh, about this that they really had, they knew that they had to be seen to be, to be doing something. It also uh, prompted a question I asked them about the, there was a report commissioned by the council and after the decision to grant plan was given, it was, the, it was a report that was shared with our elected councillors, not before but after. And in that report, buried on page 39 of a 164 page report, the people who did up the report said that it seems from the evidence that they looked into that the, the monitors for nitrous oxide emissions in the plant seem to be understating the amount of emissions. I asked the woman in the EPA responsible for enforcement, have you seen the AWA report? She didn't know what I was talking about. I said, well, I would gladly share it with you. She hadn't said that. AWN are, <laughs> and this is why it's, it's very hard to just leave it up to the system to please itself, hired by the council to advise them on whether or not to make a submission to EPA and what to put in it. On our recent visit to the cement factory, we were talking to the plant manager, and we managed to get to talk to him at one stage without Brian Gilmore, the PR guy, over his shoulder, so he was telling us a bit more than maybe he should have. And he told us that they hired a consultancy firm to advise them. They hired the same firm that the council is being advised by. AWN Consulting are advising the cement factory and the council. Now, this is something he told me from you know, witnesses in, in their own factory. So, we, you know, we have to be very vigilant. I'll try to get this on, but um, basically the EPA isn't going to do the right thing just because it's the right thing. And, you know, I mean, it would be lovely if they would, but they have to be able to be pressured. And the more people who get on, write them, email them, bombard them, and let them know that this won't go unnoticed, the more effective that will be, because they're not scared of Tim Harrigan. And they're not scared of Mary Hamlin on our own, but they're scared of hundreds of us and thousands of us. Uh, uh, just one point there, that uh, all of you, uh, any and all of you that have been damaged by dust and are concerned about all of that to your property and so on and so forth, there's, I'm not speaking on behalf of any solicitors at all whatsoever, but you do have a right to seek damages because there is negligence on their behalf, on behalf of Irish Cement. And don't forget that, the, most of, because of the uh, findings of the EPA, that there's not, that your case is proven, the negligence was on, it, it, it lies with Irish Cement. So if you're concerned about your health, go to your doctor, get your um, MRI, and so on and so forth, and and don't spare the uh, various cement when it comes to serving them with documentation, putting them on notice that in the event of uh, in further illnesses being disclosed, you'll take uh, you'll be seeking quite considerable compensation. Thank you very much. You're next, so we're just going to have to raffle just before we have your question. Okay, so. If everybody got a ticket as they came in, and the, the win ticket, win team would get a copy of, of Dr. Khan's book. Okay. 110. Okay, do we have somebody with number 110? They're all winning tickets. <laughs> do we have a winner?